that's uh, something different it's not equal to re uh, revision so now let us move to the second important cognitive process which is called attention uh, before we talk about attention or before we understand about attention i would like to you know um, uh, take a break for a for two minutes where i would like you to think about attention what attention means to you what in uh, what what you think attention is take take your time and just uh, if you have pencil pen and paper piece of paper or diary please uh, write your thoughts on the, on on the paper what attention is according to you Okay, if you have written in your notebook, I would encourage you to share your thoughts in the chat. Yeah, some of, some of you have already shared that. Wonderful. Yeah, we are getting a lot of similar uh, responses. And one of the key word that I can see uh, getting repeated is focus, which is uh, spot on. <laughs> so yeah, really uh, admire the relation that you have, uh, you know, uh, connected the attention with focus. So let's try to understand what is attention. Uh, first of all, I would like to just give you a brief about uh, the uh, attention is a, a very difficult concept to, to really, you know, um, understand, to uh, relate and to, to also, you know, to research on. And many, many of the researchers in the past have kind of uh, uh, were discouraged to, you know, further uh, do do that further research on attention, considering that it is one of the one of the very notorious difficult concept to comprehend to uh, to gather evidence on. Cognitive science defines attention as uh, it, it, it as a focus on a specific stimulus or location. So, uh, whenever we we talk about attention, it is uh, basically whenever you see something, whenever you observe something. Or whenever some you hear something, uh, if you focus on it, uh, we we can say that your your attention is on that thing. If someone is singing, and if you are if you are focusing your focusing on the song, then your attention is on the song. If you are watching a television, and many times it happens that when you are watching television in your uh, uh, at 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 home. Uh, your family members would talk. And many times you would have experienced that if you are attention, if you are completely focused on watching the television, you are not, uh, though you can, though the sound that uh, is produced as a consequence of people talking around you, though, though that sound is reaching your ears, okay? So there, though there is a stimulus, uh, but you are, not paying attention, you are not not hearing that out, and you are just focusing on your on the on the television or whatever is uh, you know is visible on the TV. So, uh, which means that we have limited capacity when we when it comes to attention, and we it is more or less like willpower. Uh, if if uh, we read the literature and we read the research about willpower, willpower is also a resource which is limited. So, if you uh, it is it is a resource which you know have a uh, is is limited in terms of capacity. If you have uh, taken a resolution three to four resolutions at the same time that I am going to reduce my weight, I am going to you know uh, master this particular field of study, I am going to um, you know uh, achieve this, achieve that, and if you have three four things on your daily routine that you want to achieve, uh, you would observe that you are not able to give justice to all of them. Because uh, whenever you uh, whenever you uh, uh, 
focus your attention or whenever you focus on certain things you are using your will power and will power reduces as a, a, a as the day proceeds and that is why many times uh, you feel we feel uh, energetic when we start our day and we many times many of us or many students like to learn or like to study in the morning when they are fresh and during the evening times they already feel exhausted they don't feel uh, to uh, encourage or they don't feel confident enough to tackle something very difficult and we also know attention is a cognitive load so and the reason why we call this cognitive load and and we also talk about cognitive overload many times in the classroom so uh, if you are passing, if we are passing a lot of information at once to the students, uh, they, their brain will get overwhelmed. Uh, they won't be able to uh, comprehend everything that is being transmitted from the teacher to the students or from wherever they, the, the information is getting transmitted. This situation is called cognitive overload, where a lot of information within a very short, a short span of time is passed to the learners. I am afraid that this session, this workshop might end up a little bit near that cognitive overload for few of you, for some of you. And uh, uh, maybe those who are already aware about the literature that I'm talking about, they might not feel, uh, uh, they might not experience cognitive overload because the information that I'm already transmitting right now might already be there in their long-term memory. So, and we just talked about memory and uh, when we talked about the memory, we were essentially talking about long-term memory. When we talk about ascent, uh, attention, we need to, be, we will be talking about something else uh, as opposed to long-term memory. So how many of you like, uh, just a, a question that I think is very interesting when it comes to attention, it's very directly related to attention. How, more, how many of you like multitasking? Um, uh, I would request to uh, request uh, Minakshi ji to launch the poll uh, of this question. How many of you like multitasking? Uh, if we have received enough responses, I would request to launch the result and uh, share the result. Result is shared, Mehul. Uh, Minakshi ji, could you describe it? I cannot see the... 82% of the people are saying yes and 18% of the people are saying no. Okay. Okay, let us see what research says. Research says that real and effective multitasking is not possible. And even if you are trying to do multitasking, uh, we are generally not focused or our attention is not 100%. Uh, it is not possible to focus on both the tasks uh, while uh, we are performing both the tasks right? or we try to perform both the tasks. We Many times we think that multitasking is like, okay, if I drive the drive a car, I am listening to music and that is multitasking. But actually either your focus is on the song or I mean prominently on the song or it would be on the on driving. And, and uh, we all know, we all have heard about this, that driving, uh, while you drive, you should not talk uh, over phone or you should not uh, avoid listening music many times because we, already, we, we know that the reaction time as a consequence of these kind of multiple information uh, being processed in our brain at the same time is uh, very slow. So research has, uh, research has proven that uh, if we try to multitask, and, and when I say multitask, real multitask, real multitasking would be something like uh, if I am asking you to focus, do multiplication, while I am also uh, uh, sharing some information, uh, which I would like you to focus on. 
uh, it, it's not in the background, but it is more like I would like you to focus or I would say read while you multiply or multiply while you read. So if we try to do that, you will find that we are generally not uh, equipped for multitasking. If we try to do that, uh, it would uh, lead to two prominent results. One would be slowing the rea reaction speed. We would be very slow in the, uh, the way we respond to anything, any stimuli that, uh, that, that appears. And at the same time, we will also find that we, will, we are less efficient while we switch between the tasks. So uh, in, in a pure way, multitasking is uh, something that is um, uh, not encouraged while you are learning something new, while you're learning something new, it is very important that the complete focus and complete attention is on the task that you're learning, uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, trying to do two things at a time. So let us watch a video. It would be kind of a small, uh, uh, you know, uh, aside. Uh, and I want all of you to be very attentive when I'm playing this video. Uh, with the, while we are talking about attention, I request all of you to be really, really attentive um, while you watch this video. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. <laughs> This matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So as you can see, this was a advert put out by uh, Transport Department of London and trying to raise awareness that why it is important to you know pay attention while you're driving or while you're on road so uh, let us you know just uh, think about this why uh, did, did you all notice how many of you kind uh, in the chat i would like to know how many of you noticed if not all 21 but few changes while you were watching the video how many of you did notice something some change Uh, you can reply on chat, just just to everyone like uh, answer on the chat. Uh, how many of you observed few changes, if not all 21? 21 even, I mean, it's not possible. Uh, Okay, and how many of you kind of noticed nothing? I mean, no change, <laughs> which, which, which of course includes me when I watched this video for the first time, I did not notice even a single change <laughs> because I was completely focused on the argument, the reasoning that the investigator was making.
Yes, absolutely. So you see the uh, uh, the increased salience theory, which is basically certain things are more salient as opposed to others. Like sometimes, um, uh, if if I ask if I show you multiple colors on a tile, and if I ask you to focus on red color directly, you will be able to focus on those red colors, right? Uh, prominently visible red colors. So our brain is wired that way that we can uh, you know uh, focus on certain things. Uh, very prominently. And when we focus our attention there, as I already mentioned in the previous slide, that it is a resource which is limited. We have already shifted our attention to certain or focused our attention to uh, a certain um, uh, attribute of uh, the, the location or stimuli. And as a consequence of that, our brain intentionally leaves out certain things which our brain feels or we feel that is not important. Uh, while we are, you know, uh, performing a particular task. So in general, something is more noticeable than other. Uh, that's what uh, the uh, theory tells us. And in this video, our attention was mainly to understand the logic, to understand the argument, to, uh, you know, understand how will the investigator figure out uh, who is the real culprit. So uh, as a consequence of that, it is quite natural that because our attention is focused on the verbal um, arguments, uh, we are not focused on the surroundings that is uh, around. So similarly in the classroom also, it is important that uh, while teaching and learning process takes place, uh, the, uh, uh, as, a, as a teacher, our responsibility is to ensure uh, by certain means to bring back attention of students if if you feel if you observe that it is going um, it's not getting focused on what you are teaching and at the same time we have to understand that attention is limited resource so uh, the way we transmit the information the way we teach students in instructions we uh, very carefully design this instruction such that there are no uh, conflicting information or instructions passing at the same time to the students now, uh, let us know in the chat, uh, I would like to understand and I would like your opinion, your understanding. What do you do to bring student attention back in the classroom? Like those who are actively teaching, uh, what, what, what are the different strategies that you deploy or you use if you want to bring uh, student attention back when you see that they are kind of you know daydreaming or, 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 or they are not paying attention, uh, crack a joke. Wonderful. Um, ask a question, yeah. Clap your hand, yes. Energizers, yeah, you ask them to move around or something like that, icebreaker activity. Uh, yeah, do some activities. Okay, give a real life examples. try to show some colorful images. And the reason I'm asking everyone to post these responses on the chat is for the entire, uh, uh, the, the pool of attendees to read each other's responses and, and try to see if there are certain strategies that they are not using, but someone else is using. Uh, they can also start using these uh, uh, strategies in their own, in, in their classroom. So yeah, give a puzzle, ask child to explain, being quiet for a couple of minutes, okay. All them in topic by having conversation with them and make it more interactive. Yeah, thank you for the responses. And I hope others have read each other's responses so that you can uh, uh, use some of the strategies uh, already informed by the community out here, uh, which uh, are quite effective in their own experiences. There's one more question where I need your responses on the chat. What kind of teaching and learning materials do you think would interest students? Like if you are teaching, developing teaching and learning materials for uh, teaching a particular subject or a topic, what kind of material, what are the criteria you keep in mind uh, if you uh, intend to use some material, teaching and learning material inside your classrooms? And this might vary from uh, young uh, primary section to secondary section. Hands-on activities, live experiments, 
विजुअल टीचिंग लर्निंग मटीरियल कलरफुल हैंड्स ऑन मटीरियल वंडरफुल एक्टिविटी बेस्ड एंगेजिंग ऑडियो विजुअल मटीरियल वंडरफुल चाइल्ड फ्रेंडली एंड कनेक्ट टू द टॉपिक ओके ऑडियो फ्लैश कार्ड विजुअल टीचिंग मटीरियल विच आर अराउंड अस इजीली अवेलेबल नेक्स्ट टू अस ओके दैट लर्निंग बाय डूइंग एक्टिविटीज ओके so again uh, the more uh, i would encourage everyone to share what they use in their classroom so that others can view these um, chats and they can try to adopt a few of them which they are comfortable with and they they feel that they can deploy in their classrooms so while you design while you think about any teaching and learning material uh, i encourage you to think about attention think about what you have learned about attention what you have discussed about attention now when it comes to attention attention the way cognitive scientists or uh, the way cognitive science tries to understand attention is in a, they use a model called working memory and uh, working memory is not a short term memory short term memory is actually a part of working memory but working memory holds uh, and manipulates info so when you talk about working memory it it actually holds and manipulates does two things it will hold the information at the same time it has the capacity to manipulate information for very short span of time and working memory our working memory is also quite limited and there is the reason why we talk about cognitive load cognitive overload is because our working memory is limited uh, and as as we are currently understanding working memory does two major functions uh, one is holding the information keeping the information for a short span of time and at the same time manipulating information for a very short uh, manipulating the information at the same time so it's like you know you giving to i i will i if if i give you two numbers to multiply and ask the answers you are also remembering those two numbers in your brain you know which numbers i have given to you uh, if those are one digit number easy if those are two digit number perhaps easy if those are three digit numbers uh, both the numbers are three digits it might be little little bit hard if i give you 10 digit numbers impossible if i give you five digit numbers it becomes very hard if i give you four digit numbers it again becomes very hard for most humans of course uh, some of you might not face that but i certainly anything goes beyond three digits i i won't be able to kind of put that in my working memory and, and uh, even if i remember those numbers manipulating which is like multiplying those two numbers in my brain might be very difficult and that is the reason why we use pen and paper to um, do those kind of calculations because our working memory capacity is quite limited if if it has information manipulating that information might becomes uh, might become li little bit difficult for the working memory so we have to while we think while we are teaching while we are doing actively teaching in the classroom it is very important to keep this concepts in mind that every child has a limited working memory capacity and uh, the processing capacity is also limited so the rate at which we can we as a teacher can do calculations or the we as a teacher can transmit information uh, is not going to match with the rate at which students are going to process the information so uh, how do you basically monitor the rate you look into their eyes you observe the students you ask them questions you get the feedback on what you are teaching and 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 course correct the rate of instructions that you are giving in the classroom now uh, when we talk about working mem memory there are three basic underlying cognitive processes uh, one is called phonological loop uh, it's like uh, uh, what you do is uh, whenever i say for example if i give you a number to remember a phone number my phone number very quickly if i just recite that number and if i say that you have to remember that number for uh, and and you don't have pen and paper and i, I mean uh, uh, i have a nice example in my mind uh, have you seen the pursuit of happiness how many of you have seen the pursuit of happiness the movie
okay i just want to uh, just reply yes or no so i just uh, statistically get some idea like how many have seen the pursuit of happiness and uh, okay those who have seen pursuit of happiness can you can you rem remember something where the main actor um, is using phonological loop at at a certain point of time in in the movie is, is does does anyone remember that okay i'll i'll uh, i'll i'll give you the instance so basically while the actor had an interview uh, as a and he got got an internship and he had a had to visit the office and confirm whether he is going to join the internship or not he gets a phone number but he is not able to grab a pen he is not uh, even if he is able to grab a pen he is not able to find a piece of paper so he has to remember the entire phone number in the mind now because he does, does not have paper he is basically step out steps out his house and goes to nearby shop where he is constantly reciting the number in his mind keeping uh, ensuring that the, he doesn't slip the number doesn't slip from his mind we do this a lot of time right when we basically uh, when someone passes a quick information to you what you would do is you would try to recite it multiple times if you don't have a place where to capture that information so that is called phonological loop and uh, this process is different than visual special sketch sketch pad for example if i ask you how will you uh, reach to the nearest shop where you can buy milk if i ask you right now it's uh, you would do a different cognitive uh, the process that happens in your mind is different you would be able to easily think about visualize the space space uh, around yourself you know where to go in which direction you have to first move where when to take left when to take right and then eventually reach that particular point and it is very easier to retrieve this information and faster to uh, even you know um, uh, process this and then there is a cognitive process and uh, which, which is called central executive which uh, is not very well understood but uh, in general when you learn something whenever there is a whenever there is a stimuli whenever you are learning something you are hearing something you are reading something for and whenever the learning process is happening the information is initially stored in your working memory <coughs> processed in your working memory and then it basically passes on to the long term memory and central executive is, is believed to basically pass the information to and fro from working memory to the long term memory okay so now we are going to talk about the third important cognitive process and uh, uh, there is a quick poll if, uh, uh, if if minakshi ji can launch this which of these square is the darkest is it the left most it is the right most or oh, no okay minakshi ji can you just uh, uh, please uh, share the i mean describe the result i, I can't see the polls right now more 41% of the people have you know voted they are still voting so right okay here are the results so uh, 38% of them say left most and 18% say right most while 45% say all are equally dark wonderful <clears throat> so uh in the chat can you can you just um, uh those who have understood which cognitive process i might be touching upon now uh, could you uh, put in the chat we talked about memory we talked about attention now we are going to talk about something yes exactly uh, we are right now going to touch upon the third cognitive process called perception 
a, a very important process uh, when we talk about learning. And yeah, all the squares are equally dark. Uh, I just need to remove the background. As soon as I remove the background, you will see the effect. The squares are going to be the same. I just going to, I'm just going to remove the gradient background that I have placed um, uh, behind the squares. So as soon as I do that, we all find that the squares are all equally dark. It was the background, it was the environment that led all of you, some of you to perceive the, and of course we all perceive the darkness differently. I perceive it differently, but then there is a, um, then uh, what you do is basically you use the, use something which is called top-down processing. Many of you who, who have used top-down processing, they used your prior knowledge, maybe uh, your experience with this kind of puzzles where you know that these are the gradient which is in the background might be the reason why the squares are appearing uh, with different shades. So some of you have already used that process, some of you have not used the process, but uh, perception as we know is different than sensation. We all well, uh, the light that was being emitted by this square was same. All the squares emitted the same light. Uh, so essentially the sensation was the same, but the perception, the way we perceive the, the darkness of the square was different. Uh, and when we talk about perception, there are majorly two way we process information. <clears throat> so either we do bottom, bottom up processing, which happens majorly in younger kids, uh, which generally begins and ends with a stimulus. So as soon as a fire alarm uh, rings, uh, there will be a panic, they, they, they'll get scared, they don't know what to do, and uh, they, they don't have the prior knowledge that they can invoke to choose the reaction, choose the behavior during that time. As opposed to that, when we talk about top-down processing, what we do is essentially, uh, we use uh, prior knowledge, uh, which might be like the uh, standard operating procedure when a fire alarm uh, rings or a standard operating procedure when earthquake happens. We know what we need to do. If you already have the knowledge, if you already have the uh, understanding of the standard operating, operating procedures, we would basically invoke that. Our brain will invoke that and we'll, we'll follow that. So the response that happens when we we are using top-down processing is different and when the bottom-up processing is also quite different and as we as learners mature as learners become master or as learner gains more mastery the way they respond to the the, the way they perceive information and process information changes and majority of us generally mo mostly we use top-down processing as opposed to bottom-up processing and this leads and this helps us to understand that though we all get the same kind of stimuli or sensation, the way we perceive the world around us is different. So whenever you're teaching, whenever we are teaching a certain concept of certain, uh, certain um, uh, learning is happening in the classroom, the way all the students are going to perceive that information or perceive the uh, learning is going to be different and unique. So that is something that we all as a teacher, uh, we should keep in mind that different people uh, perceive things differently, uh, though the stimuli might be the same. So we have kind of talked about three cognitive processes, uh, important processes that I feel uh, uh, teachers should, um, an educator should have uh, and gain more understanding about these three processes. Memory, when we talked about memory, we talked about uh, the, activation of certain neuron pathways, we call that engram. And uh, whenever we, uh, we also talked about consolidation, which is like after over a period of time, if we, if we rest, uh, once we activate a certain pathway, it will get firm. And then we can, again, if you do the same kind of, if we do the similar process of learning, or if we learn the same concept again, uh, the same, uh, we retrieve the information, the same pathway is activated again. And uh, majorly we were talking about long-term memory. Uh, how does the brain stores memory? And then we talked about attention where we talked about working memory. We understand that attention is limited resource. Uh, uh, working memory can 
hold information as well as it can manipulate the information and that's why it has a limited resource so uh, we also discussed about cognitive load uh, when we talked about attention and finally we talked about perception so i just would like you to uh, take a moment and just consolidate your thoughts around these three cognitive processes maybe you can do this by writing one sentence about each in your notebook or the diary or the or the paper we'll just i'll just i'll give you say a minute or two write something uh, i mean write what do you understand from memory uh, about memory in one or two sentences you can use two sentences as well or uh, same about attention and perception or whatever you can recall that you discussed so far okay it was a it was an exercise for each of us just to uh, write our thoughts about uh, memory attention perception and in fact uh, through this i was um, encouraging you to retrieve the information that was transmitted by me uh, during the uh, uh, a few few minutes that we you know were interacting about this processes so now uh, we'll talk about the final phase uh, how do we apply this learning in the classroom what do we learn from these all principles now there are multiple things that we know we know about memory how brain stores knowledge information how what is attention uh, what is working memory uh, it is a limited resource what is perception everybody perceives things differently though they might be in the same settings uh so we have this background we also have background about brain how uh, how you know uh, if we practice something often what we do is basically we uh, make the connection stronger the path pathways which are active in that process will become more active and stronger and as a consequence of that something which is very difficult at the outset when you are learning for the first time the same thing would be very easy after you have practiced enough so what do we learn from all this and how do we basically connect this and how do we uh, uh, how do uh, these uh, core principle inform the uh, teaching and learning process in our classroom so how to help students learn new ideas so whenever you are helping students to learn new idea it is very important to connect the new knowledge whatever you are teaching them whatever we are teaching them in the classroom for the first time we try to connect that with the prior knowledge because it is very important that they uh, uh, and and this goes uh, this connects to perception the way they are going to perceive the information that we are going to share would depend on the their knowledge if they are doing top down processing so we need to uh, fix the new knowledge or connect the new knowledge in the schema or schemata that they already have in their mind use analogies but sufficiently elaborate on them so it is very important that you use you use analogy but you elaborate on them you provide sufficient information for them to understand the analogy and at the same time it is also important for teachers for educators to talk about the similarities and dissimilarities because many times uh, using analogies without talking about the dissimilarities with the 
with the concept that you are teaching leads to misconceptions um, so so it is very important to talk about the boundaries what is really matching what is not matching what is analogous what is not analogous when we talk when we use analogies in our classroom but uh, using analogies will certainly help because uh, analogies is something that you use the analogies with they already know students already students have experienced uh, in their environment and when you use those kind of analogies you are kind of using uh, their prior knowledge to try to help them learn something new avoid any kind of information overload uh, of course you might feel that this workshop might be a little bit information overload uh, but uh, in classroom we should avoid information overload we should gradually increase the sophistication um, start simple things then gradually move to the to the complex things uh, we uh, have practical requirements of completing syllabus but problem is that when we try to complete the syllabus without uh, providing enough practice when I say enough practice I mean to um, to to me enough practice is the practice that will help the students to uh, you know build those connections in the brain such that the uh, retrieval of that information is very fast for them and they uh, can uh, do those tasks or do those kind of uh, um, say if it is multiplication they can do it fast they can do it uh, naturally normally without um, having to invoke their working memory uh, to do that then uh, provide scaffolds scaffolds are very important when we uh, during the initial teaching learning process uh, we should initially provide scaffolds uh, of course we have to monitor what kind of scaffolds we provide but over a period of time uh, slowly and steadily reduce the scaffolds that we are providing to them uh, we need to remember that while we provide the scaffold that uh, the reason why we provide scaffold is that sometimes uh, as we know that there is a limited working memory and we don't want to uh, want them to think about a lot of information at the same time so certain things are given certain things are uh, certain things they have to basically recall or use from their long term memory provide complementary information when we are teaching so whenever uh, you're talking about uh, say uh, measuring area of a triangle talk about a table which is triangular and how do we basically measure the area of that so so kind of they will be connecting the uh, concept they're learning in the textbook with, with the outside world uh, complementarily and they will be, be able to make, uh, build a better connections with the uh, with the concept and will be able to comprehend it in a better way and always ask a question that have the students mastered the prerequisite research says that uh, it is very difficult if you do the if you do the literature survey about what is the appropriate age for say students learning coding uh, unfortunately there is there is not enough research which says that at this age you cannot teach python to students we have we would have observed that many students at a very early age they learn python and many students they they may not be able to uh, learn python even at the age of 16 so uh, everyone is unique and different uh, instead of thinking about what is the age appro appropriate age or um, age for for learning or teaching something uh, we should always think in terms of are all the prerequisites required to learn this uh, already acquired by the learner if the learner has mastered the prerequisite you are uh, in principle free to teach or or, or teaching uh, of a new concept would be more successful how do we help students learn and retain information learning is something that we just talked about that we have to teach students what are the strategies we deploy informed from science of learning and uh, if we want to help them retain information how do we do that uh, there are uh, whenever you reactivate the neural pathways uh, in their long term memory you are basically helping them to make the knowledge more firm or help them to um, master that or help them to uh, retrieve the knowledge even faster the next time so ask for explanation ask them questions which help which would require them to explain what they know this will help them to retrieve the information not just retrieve the information but also analyze the information and and even beyond that to basically summarize the entire information that they might have so summarize different concepts and basically form an explanation so explanation form forming an explanation is a very good strategy that uh, teachers can apply deploy in classroom ask students to make uh, uh, create uh, 
uh, form explanations for uh, the concept or topic that is being uh, learned. Use retrieval practice. There's, there's enough ton of research on retrieval practices. And as I earlier said, retrieval practice is not revision. Revision is in the most case is about re uh, going through going through the same uh, teaching and learning material again. That's called in a, in a traditional term. It is called revision. Of course, there are people who revise by retrieval practices. That there are there, there are students who would use retrieval practice as a for, as a while they revise. So retrieval practice should be generally where the students are being asked questions, asked to organize their thoughts or asked to basically bring, pull in the information that they have already in their brain and uh, try to, you know, retrieve that information back. Uh, and that, that, that is essentially the main difference between retrieval practice and revision. Uh, so use as many as strategies that are helpful for retrieval practice. You ask questions to ask them to recall information. Uh, and of course you can provide scaffolds wherever required. We can use uh, to fix information in the form of stories. That's why they are very powerful tool of uh, storing, storing information. It's very easier to uh, store um, uh, stories in your brain. And of course, many times we also use different mnemonics also, which are also very powerful. How many of you do can kind of, you know, um, have used or remember, still remember some form of mnemonic that they have learned in the school, even though they would have not revised or they would have not, you know, used it in the past, in, in the recent years. I, I think a lot of you, I can, I can, I, I still remember how to, what are the first 30 elements in periodic table. And that is due to the mnemonic that I still remember, though I've learned in the 11th and 12th chemistry, uh, chemistry, but, but still I remember those. So we all remember these kind of certain mnemonics, which would help you to retrieve. Yeah. Ped mass is one of them. Uh, are, are there, uh, people, uh, I mean, you can share any other, uh, yeah. Vibgyor is one, one way you basically remember all the colors and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those are BB Roy goes to Bombay via gateway of India or something like that. That is how you remember the resistance. Uh, values, uh, how do you calculate that uh, values of resistance for resistors, right? So these are the different mnemonics which really help students to uh, retrieve the information very easily. So um, they are very powerful. We should use them. Uh, we should also use spaced practice. Now, spaced practice is again, it relates back to the um, uh, encoding, then consolidation, then retrieval. So if we uh, if students learn multiplication today, uh, give them uh, and, and after after two, three days, again, go back to that. And after some some time, again, go back to that. So space practice over a period of time, over a certain interval of time really helps students to uh, learn and uh, learn and master things as opposed to last minute cramming. So cramming the information on the last day for the exam is generally not generally not found helpful uh, in the long run. It might be immediately helpful to them but in the long run uh, when when it comes to uh, you know uh, developing long term memory or skills or um, uh, skills uh, it it is not helpful cramming is generally not helpful use low or no stakes quizzes so in your classroom you can use quizzes which are not summative assessment those are more like uh, formative assessments uh, they are either they are low stakes or no stakes so uh, so that students can um, without any fear of uh, you know uh, the result or consequence they can basically attempt those quizzes which would help you to uh, help them to retain information that they have learned previously and that would also give provide uh, important feedback to teachers that how many of the students are able to retrieve the information that they already learned in the past and uh, Interleaving is also a very important uh, strategy that is informed by science of learning. Interleaving means that suppose you are teaching multiplication, addition, subtraction, and division to students for younger grades. Um, and if you are after teaching multiplication, you just ask, uh, you just um, ask them to solve problems of multiplication. Um, but it is important. It, it, it is useful. Uh, research says that 
if you interleave these processes like they can you, you can give them uh, some problems of multiplication addition multi division subtraction together uh, that kind of practice would help them to um, you know uh, retrieve the information better and also master the uh, processes that they are learning master the skills that they are acquiring finally helping students to solve problems uh, if you want to help them to solve problems uh, we need to help students free their working memory by supporting them to learn a set of facts required to solve problems in a particular subject every subject has this all subjects requires uh, a certain set of basic facts that if students are equipped with those they are equipped to solve certain set of problems without that asking them to solve those problems would be very difficult so there is a there is a certain body of knowledge basic set of facts that is required for every subject um, for maths it might be like if you want to solve three digits multiplication remembering the multiplication table multiplication facts we call it multiplication facts is very important because it would uh, straight away if you know what is eight into five you would directly get it get that information from long-term memory as opposed to you know invoking your working memory or loading your working memory uh, into that so so that will be even faster for you uh, you'll focus on uh, the long division method or long multiplication method as opposed to retrieving the information of um, what is eight into five multiplication fact same way provide effective feedback now feedback many times when we provide feedback it is very important that uh, the focus is on what students are doing the task uh, if it is multiplication if it is division if it is if they're learning science, it is about science, it is about arguments, it is about uh, explanations, it is about reasoning. So focus on the task as opposed to students. Uh, generally, any comment, any any comment or any, um, uh, you know, uh, any feedback on an individual is, it is generally not helpful because that kind of builds an impression or that kinds of uh, uh, builds an impression in the mind of students that their ability is being in question. So never focus on the ability as opposed to focus on the uh, process. Um, and we all know that problem solving, a novice would solve problems differently than expert. In physics, if we talk about problem solving, student, uh, uh, students who are novice, they might be just talking about what is known, what is given, what is not given, and how do you basically use formula, what formulas do I use to find the unknown when I already have the known given. But if it, if you study and uh, researchers have already studied the process or the approaches or strategies used by experts to solve problem, and they are not similar to the strategies used by novices. So provide students enough time and practice to transit between these stages. Uh, they will take time to consolidate a lot of information and learn new strategies, even heuristic methods that will help them to uh, become an expert problem solver. And always, if you are talking about mathematics, always connect the concrete concept with abstract concept, go from abstract to concrete, switch between them. So create a correlation between these two, uh, which would help students to, you know, visualize the problems. How to support the learners arriving at school? Now, this is something, a very important question that we all are facing. And this relates to a lot of uh, emotional uh, side of the learners as well. So intelligence and ability can be improved through hard work. That is the message that we want to give to students. And uh, it is already informed by new neuro, I mean, from neuroscience that um, uh, our brain is an active, uh, um, you know, active organ. It The connections between the neurons would develop even at at, at whatever age, uh, I mean, we are, and that, you know, uh, that is quite important for students to know that uh, their ability and their intelligence is not static. It can improve uh, based on the practice and hard work that they do. So I think when the students start coming to schools, there'll be a lot, uh, there'll be huge learning gap. The concepts that we will be teaching to the students would be difficult for them to understand uh, in, instead of directly going to the uh, these concepts that might be suppose you are teaching in grade eight mathematics, um, I and it is recommended by all uh, many educators that 
if you can deploy and use diagnostic testing, try to understand what students already know before you teach uh, at the grade level because students might need support at the concepts or in the concept which they have already missed in the previous grade. So it is very important when students re, uh, rejoin the school for us to understand diagnose, uh, do the do enough diagnostic testing to understand what kind of skills they have at present. And uh, it is very important to start from there instead of uh, directly uh, aiming at the syllabus at hand. Praise and effort goes a long way. So praise the effort and completion as opposed to the ability. So whenever students complete something or whenever they are uh, making an effort, praise those things, which will help them and they will understand that uh, uh, they will, uh, and, and, and there, there is a message that we are passing that effort and effort and completion of task is being uh, praised as opposed to individuals or as opposed to, you know, individual's capacity and individual's capacity is, is not static. It will, uh, it will, it can be improved over a period of time when put enough effort. Encourage learning goals versus performance goals. So uh, instead of thinking about whether getting 30 out of 30 or 25 out of 30, that, that should not be the focus and that should not be encouraged in the classroom, especially at this time when there is a lot of learning gap. So it is more that we encourage about, okay, what did you learn? Uh, what you initially, a uh, child was able to do multiplication of two digits. Now the child is able to do multiplication of three digits. So that learning goal is, goal is something that we should encourage that, okay, it's very good that you have moved from two digit to three digit multiplication. It doesn't matter whether uh, at, at present initially, it doesn't matter whether you are able to store 25 out of 30 or 30 out of 30. Time your feedback. Many times it is important to give the feedback immediately and many times it is important to uh, give a delayed feedback. It, it has to be well chosen and provide safe and secure learning environment to students. Right now, students would be uh, after this long, uh, you know, out of the school period, they would be generally scared about uh, the way they are being perceived by other learners and by the teachers. So it is very important we, as an educator and teacher create a culture of and culture and environment in the classroom where there is no threat to mistake. There is no, uh, no penalty to, you know, say something stupid. Um, uh, and there is no, all questions are valid questions. Uh, and uh, uh, generally uh, the entire class, not just teachers, but also the students, the culture, we build culture such that students argue on concepts and argue on think about and talk about the uh, reasoning that a person is making as opposed to who is making the reasoning or who is uh, presenting the argument. So quick look is uh, basically, uh, it is useful uh, when, when students are learning, it is useful to use space practice and interleaving. We already discussed that. Uh, when students are, uh, they want to develop deep understanding, elaboration and concrete examples are very helpful. And uh, when they want to affect uh, the reinforce, when we want to reinforce the knowledge or recall the knowledge, or we want to um, help them master the a particular concept, it is important that we provide enough opportunities for uh, information retrieval. And also uh, we, kind of use multiple uh, tools, uh, visual tools, um, uh, audio visual tools, so that the information is coded in different forms. Of course, not in conflict, conflicting manner, but complementary manner, so that it assists in uh, comprehension of the information. So uh, we will end this now, we'll end the workshop with uh, a few questions, uh, and those are poll questions as well. So uh, let us hit the first question. Do students have that preferred learning style? I request Milakshi to launch the poll. The poll is launched. I believe everyone can see it because I don't see anybody, you know responding.
I have relaunched the poll. I hope everyone can see it now. Uh, once the once we get enough responses, uh, would request Minakshi ji to share the results. Sure, ma'am. Uh, right, we have the results here for the question. Do students have their preferred learning style? Eighty-two percent of the attendees have said yes. Eighteen percent have said no. And zero percent uh, is there for no idea, so they responded as yes or no. Okay, thank you. So uh, let us move to the next slide. So individual learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style. This is a uh, a widely hold uh, misconception, as the research says. Uh, so there are not. Uh, you know, uh, preferred the way we understand preferred learning style styles, and uh, uh, but yeah, of course, there 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 have been multiple intelligence theory, which has you know prominently we believe that there are different types of preferred learning styles. But uh, research says that no, that is not the case. Of course, we learn through different uh, uh, we learn uh, uh, in in different ways, but uh, there are no preferred learning styles basically. Uh, let us go to the next question. I'll, I'll provide the references where we can, uh, where the uh, attendees can uh, find answers, detailed answers to these questions because we have already exceeded the time quite a bit. So I would move to the next question. Uh, Minakshi ji, if you can launch this uh, question as well. <clears throat> sure, ma'am. It's already launched. Uh, please pardon the typo. Uh, the question is: Are you a left brain or right brain person? Instead of off, please read it as or. Is a typo out there? So we have the results for this poll, Mehul. Hmm. Um, okay, thirty-eight percent say that they are a left brain person. Thirty-five percent say that they are a right brain person. While twenty-eight percent say that they don't believe in left brain, right brain theory. Hmm. Okay, so this is also one myth. that we believe that we are right brain left brain no that's not the case we use both the hemisphere of the brain and uh, of course uh, the different processes happen in different hemisphere but uh, it it is not uh, it is not specially located out there it, it, it brain is an interconnected organ and uh, uh, a, a a widely hold misbelief is that uh, people are either left brain or either uh, right brain there is nothing like black and white it's not like that so that's another uh, Uh, misconception that we uh, that many people hold at what age does the brain development saturates that's the last question of this workshop minakshi ji request you to launch this question as well i've launched it now i hope everyone can see it 
थैंक यू so we have the results here for the question at what age does the brain development stops uh, 22% say at the age of 6 14% say at the age of 12 6% say at the age of 16 and 58% are of the opinion that it never stops yeah so brain development generally continues and does not stop after a certain age that's what uh, research says uh even at the age of 40 your brain is developing even at the age of 50 your brain uh, development continues it all depends what kind of environment you are in what kind of processes we are getting engaged with what kind of learning are we uh, doing or what kind of activities are we doing so based on what we do our brain keeps on uh, you know uh, developing it never stops uh developing and uh, yeah i i had specifically mentioned saturates not stop so yeah so these are the key references that i have referred and i have informed myself when i was uh, researching and uh, researching about this topic the uh, these three uh, the, there are two books uh, on the left side the new science of learning as well as how, understanding how we learn Two very interesting books that which I would encourage um, uh, every educator to you know read uh, to understand uh, further uh, about the topics that we have discussed uh, in this workshop and uh, a, a very beautiful summary about this uh, the principles which I have discussed and many uh, uh, strategies that I have included in my slides are coming from the uh, the science of learning report by uh, deans for impact. so these are some key key references i have referred while i prepared for this uh, workshop and um, yeah thank you so much for joining and uh, i think we have exceeded well very well exceeded beyond the time uh, and uh, i really apologize for that uh, um, uh, but but really thank you that all of you joined and uh, interacted uh, on during this workshop uh these are some upcoming workshops that we have planned um uh just just to name a few leveraging the power of steam labs in school implementing experiential learning in classroom effective computer science pedagogy for classrooms and so on and so forth uh and we will be also be uh, adding workshops on how to use uh simulations um, in uh classroom teaching and learning for science and mathematics subjects in the future so um i really encourage uh, all the uh, attendees here to uh, subscribe register for these uh, workshops as well and uh, 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 yeah we would be providing certificates uh, uh, those who attend these workshops and, and i once again thank all of you uh, i'm sorry there is a that i have exceeded uh, beyond a certain time and again sorry for uh, cognitive overload if that happened <laughs> so yeah thank you for uh, joining and uh, i think uh, if you uh, would um, like us to answer some questions uh, please share on the chat we would be answering them uh, once the workshop ends there are some quick questions i can answer or else we'll answer the questions after the uh, after the workshop gets over 
we will send you the uh, email you the responses to the queries <clears throat> Uh, anybody from my team member, is, is there any announcement that uh, you have to make, Ashish or Rahul, anything that you would like to share here? Hi, so a further update about our upcoming workshops are updated in our website. So we'll be sharing in the chat now. So. Those who are interested for uh, registering for the upcoming uh, workshops, I request them to just uh, go to our website and uh, uh, please register yourself for the workshop. Thank you. There is a question. If a child is not up to the grade level, then how to help him or her? Yeah, many times it happens that uh, as, a, as, um, as, as a result of multiple uh, uh, conditions, uh, all the students are not... Um, up to the concepts that you are teaching in the classroom or, or you're teaching at that particular grade level. Uh, my uh, recommendation is that uh, do a diagnostic testing, understand what skills students are already having, what, what kind of operations or what kind of learning or understanding the child has. And based on the prerequisite, uh, uh, provide the child uh, special care where, wherein uh, it could be like uh, after school hours where the where the student is being taken through, uh, you know, uh, the learning and the, uh, the concepts that you want to teach to fill the bridge the gap. Uh, it could be either after school hours or it could be either tagging the student with uh, some other adults. Uh, making the uh, their parents or some someone who has the capacity to teach them to know that where the students where, where the where that particular child is uh, uh, behind and uh, clearly helping them to understand where where the child is behind to and also providing the material if you are not yourself not teaching the student after school hours to help the student uh, bridge the gap and you know um, um, take him to take him or her to the level where he or uh, uh, she understands what you are teaching in your regular classrooms. Yes, we'll be providing the certificates. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you. Thank you for joining and I hope the workshop was um, informative and also I would encourage you to uh, refer to or study further about these uh, topics um, using the references that which I have cited. Thank you.